I don't know what I did, but um, if it's working, it's working. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, this series of talks is a real um, privilege to be able to join. Um, an embarrassing number of years ago now, uh, Miles contacted Yadvinda and me about the possibility of coming over and meeting Norma. Um, and uh, we jumped at the opportunity. It seemed really exciting. Uh, I think we both immediately saw the opportunity to look at uh, climate gradients, but fundamentally, um, it's a biological hotspot for uh, globally. Um, there's a huge amount of wilderness there. There are a number of surrounding issues, both academic and socioeconomic, and it was a perfect opportunity to get involved. Um, we first met Norma. We were going down this, uh, this ridge that you see behind all the writing, and um, we were walking down the trotcher, and my first meeting with Norma was she appeared out of um, the forest up a slope that just seemed impossibly steep and she was going at 100 miles an hour and was completely not out of breath unlike the rest of us um, and it was this sort of revelation of this really expert biologist knowing her environment inside out and um, uh, much as I was fitter and younger than I am now uh, um, I was extremely impressed by how fit and um, together she was in a, in a challenging environment. So that, that's where it all started. Um, we got a small biodiverse, uh, biocomplexity grant that Miles led from NSF, and then we began to win some other grants from our national research councils. Um, the work's gone on for quite a long time. Uh, as you can see, there's a great uh, cast of um, characters there. Uh, and of course, as well as uh, hugely grateful to Norma, I am to Eric as well, who, and both of you have made uh, this work possible and made the collaboration uh, fun and a real privilege. Uh, and then some extra names to mention uh, in, in addition to um, collaborators are in particular Adam um, Kakwana, who's been uh, with us right from the start uh, and he's provided uh, support and ongoing measurements right throughout the work uh, and in recent years, Andrew Nottingham has led a lot of the research as a postdoc and um, I'm particularly pleased to be able to say that Andrew has recently won a fellowship and a lectureship together at Leeds University. So he now has um, uh, an independent um, uh, position uh, and much is very well earned and he's done some great work over the years. Uh, lots of other people involved in this work um, and it began in terms of um, postdoctoral research assistance with Michael Zimmerman whose name is there in the middle. Okay, um, first a little bit of background, I don't want to spend too long on this. Uh, here are uh, some of the major global carbon stores in the atmosphere, we have about 800 petagrams of carbon and then um, in tropical forest uh, uh, we have very large components of the global stores of carbon that you see down there. And you see that the store in soil organic matter is much larger than that in plant biomass. <clears throat> and tropi the tropics comprise around a third of that. And the flux from soil of carbon to the atmosphere is about this number here, about half of the total flux of respiration to the atmosphere and it's um, the balance is with photosynthesis and of course there's a small net balance that leads to net gain um, into the land surface providing around 30 percent of um, uh, the sink to the uh, planetary surface. Um, so a small fractional change in these numbers could of course be very large but our understanding of that fractional change is um, rather limited. Uh, the graph on the left shows uh, that the uncertainty in terms of the overall net ecosystem productivity predicted by models is largest in the tropics. And from a soil point of view, one of the reasons why that uncertainty is so large is that we don't really know what the effects of warming are on the overall soil carbon balance. And one reason for that is 
well, we don't have many experiments from the tropics, and that's only recently begun to change. There are some assumptions made by models about the response to temperature. Um, there may be a slightly, well, the models and theory have predicted a lower temperature response in terms of decomposition, emissions to the atmosphere. There might be less absolute warming in, than higher latitudes, but there's great uncertainty over that. And then perhaps the biggest uncertainty is microbial effects on decomposition rates. And the graph on the right hand side at the bottom demonstrates some of this uncertainty. Uh, we have time along the bottom, changing global carbon on the vertical axis. The blue line in the middle is a standard model and the two green lines represent the extent of our uncertainty in terms of how microbial responses to warming might affect the overall uh, gain or loss of carbon. And it's a very large uncertainty. Of course, the tropics contribute part of that, not all of it. So how do all of these uh, different factors interact? Uh, well, of course, the more you get into this subject, the more complicated it becomes, but hopefully we can pull out some generalities here. Uh, perhaps conceptually, it starts with climate, um, phys biophys well, physical drivers of temperature on reaction rate, moisture, CO2 supply affecting how vegetation responds, the, res the effect of vegetation on the substrate supply for respiration, for breakdown in soil, and their simultaneous effects on uh, enzyme uh, uh, concentration and activity, the amount of exudates from soils, and the impact on the composition of carbon in the soil. Is it a highly labile form or a rather recalcitrant form? And of course, the impact of all of those on the microbial community and their interaction, affecting both the, the uh, composition of the microbial community, but also the total biomass. And all of these factors combine, in this particular diagram at least, to affect soil carbon dynamics and um, to affect an overall gain or loss. So what were the sort of underlying questions that we were asking uh, from the outset? Well, we were aware that soil carbon stocks were likely to be large. The first time you um, set foot on these hills, you see significant organic carbon uh, reserves. What might be the feedback on warming? And could we address this question over short and long timescales? Of course, the other really obvious thing is that this is a huge natural gradient in climate and soils, and biodiversity, and uh, uh, we had uh, enough information to realize that there was a large variation in function, at least above ground, and I think we knew less about what was going in the soil. Now, to the background of all of this, I, I had been mad enough to try and set up a rainfall exclusion experiment in lowland rain, rainforest, and um, as a, I suppose as a community, we'd been thinking about how to address uh, major climate, uh, the effects of major climate factors on uh, functioning in forest. And of course, the next question after you drought a forest was, well, maybe can we warm it? Um, and having challenged myself fairly significantly in keeping the rain off a of forest, I thought I really didn't want to face trying to put electricity into the soil and warm it up in a remote location. So this was the perfect opportunity to not have to um, have a high maintenance experiment and make use of the elevation difference and associated uh, temperature difference to look at warming effects. Subsequently, Andy Nottingham has actually done an in situ warming experiment, and I have a slide right at the end um, representing those, <clears throat> the results from that, which are very exciting. Okay, so we're interested in the interactions. This isn't necessarily a linear um, uh, network, but the interactions between, between temperature, soil carbon, nutrients and microbes. And also underlying that, uh, we were interested in learning about microbial communities. There was really almost nothing known about them at the time. Their biogeography, uh, which turned out to be a fascinating story, and of course their overall response to climate. So this uh, slide, I think Ken produced it many years ago. It's incredibly useful, um, and I like the way the plots um, look like they fit so well onto the, onto the slope. Um, but it gives an idea of the distances involved. There's a very large change in elevation and associated temperature over the first, um, uh, well, over most of the elevation gradient. And then we also connect with the site that we were just talking about, Tumbapata, for lowland rainforest sites right in the distance at 
um, 26 degrees. So we see a large temperature change of uh, more than 15 degrees C across all of these plots. And all these plots have long-term um, measurements of tree growth. And uh, Yadvinder spoke about the multiple flux data from uh, these plots. And of course, um, more recently, Greg and Robin have uh, done flyovers looking at traits. And I know Brian has been deeply involved with looking at traits as well. And in fact, I think he was trying to look at them today, uh, sorry, this year, and got stuck in Peru. Uh, and that sounded like it was um, uh, challenging to get his team back home. Um, OK, this is a diagram of the transect as we first saw it. We realized we were limited by resources, so we had to choose four different sites down the transect to look at this temperature difference. And here they are marked out on the diagram from 3,000 meters down to um, 220 meters. And this gives you a slightly different view of the same thing. We have the, the elevation change, approximate temperature difference, and overall uh, temperature switch of plus and minus 15 degrees C. And here we have the uh, temperature data that um, Miles published on um, uh, the change in temperature with elevation. So I want to start with the first um, couple of years of data where we installed a translocation experiment across elevations. And these pictures that you see on the right we'll go into in the subsequent slides. Um, the transit's over three kilometers in elevation. It, it's just astonishingly large and over a short horizontal distance. It allows one to achieve something that is logistically difficult in the first place, but transferring soils across this distance was possible. Um, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with all of those uh, locations. This was the original design of the soil translocation experiment. We took out 50 centimeter cores. Uh, we retained the mineral core intact and root-free organic layer. Uh, we installed soil moisture probes into each one. We reinstalled those cores at each location and then took three to one of each of the other locations. So we did a full um, translocation in both directions. There's a nylon mesh at the bottom of the cores to um, hinder root intrusion, but allow drainage. Um, and we also wanted to focus on temperature rather than moisture. Now, it turns out that our data suggested that none of these sites were moisture constrained uh, for any significant amount of time over the course of the year, but we wanted to constrain that. So we put um, end caps on, um, which amounted to narrowing or broadening the top of the uh, cores to try and control for water ingress into the plots to maintain the same uh, rainfall across the gradient. Um, and here you see pictures of the uh, cores being extracted, being dug out. Um, and there's Michael Bird, who's now in Australia, carrying uh, one of these cores down the hill. And they're not light. Um, it's a large amount of work. There's Michael Zimmerman sampling the soil and Adam making uh, some of the first preparations of those cores. Uh, and then here's the finished product. Uh, each, at each site we had this lattice of cores with different funnels on them to account for the rainfall uh, and then control collars just on the top of the soil where we measured just net soil um, CO2 efflux. What did we do at those sites? Well we did a whole range of things. We um, obviously measured temperature and moisture. We uh, sampled the soil periodically for the uh, bulk density and soil carbon concentration. We did some fertilization experiments. These are these brightly colored tubes which look rather nice, um, are part of a fertilization experiment to see how adding nutrients affected decomposition rates. Uh, we looked at enzyme activities. Here's some lab equipment, fluorometer to do that. Um, so this is more of the fertilization experiment. And on the left-hand side, um, this is the slightly more uh, ambitious version of the soil respiration data. When um, Andy uh, took this work forward 
after the first translocation, we were able to get hold of some automatic soil respiration chambers. Um, this is a um, quite a large array of those cha chambers, but you can see they're, they're big units. And um, he organized, um, he and Adan organized a team to move these up and down the mountain, and it was a major logistical effort. So, and there's data still emerging from that. Okay, what did the data look like? Uh, so uh, the first data are perhaps the um, most obvious. Uh, we see a change in carbon stock with, uh, that should be really elevation, shouldn't it, not altitude. Um, uh, we see a large increase with elevation. At high elevation, the soil carbon store is more than three quarters of all carbon in the ecosystem, and that declines to about 50% um, at low elevation. And of course that reflects, um, partly reflects the amount of above ground vegetation. Uh, now the, uh, Michael Zimmerman had a particular interest in fractionating uh, the soil and he separated the soil organic carbon into different components, mineral bound, particulate and organic layer. And we see variation in those changes um, up the mountain. Uh, and of course, at that time, the climate sensitivity of this soil carbon store was very poorly um, known. Additional information on what those soils look like. So on the left hand side, we have NMR traces telling us the relative contribution of different types of uh, carbon compounds. And the traces look complicated, but in essence, they tell us that at the higher elevation sites, so for example, 3,000 meters at Waikecha, we have relatively uh, more labile carbon, uh, and at the lower elevation sites, we have relatively more recalcitrant carbon. So the recalcitrant carbon is on the left-hand side of this, of this chemical shift diagram, and the labile carbon um, is on the right-hand side. And we see this represented in bar graphs on the right-hand side. Uh, here we have absolute amount of carbon per meter cubed uh, against elevation. And we see that the labile uh, components are, um, although there's much more of them in the uh, high elevation sites, proportionately uh, there is less of the recalcitrant types. And the reason why we're interested in that is that we were aware that uh, from kinetic theory that complex carbon compounds are likely to be decomposed with a higher temperature sensitivity than labile carbon compounds. And we thought that might affect the temperature sensitivity of the soil carbon dynamics. So our soil um, refers to soil respiration, the emission of CO2 from soil. Uh, models determining that are often climate driven in uh, earth system models. In more recent years, they've become much more complicated, but at the time they were really um, really driven by temperature and moisture alone. Um, but of course, we, we've been aware that, that both, there are both physical and biological constraints on that flux. Uh, of course, there's the response of both the animal and plant community. Uh, part of our studies have looked at uh, invertebrate changes up the elevation gradient, though I don't show those data here. Of course, the response of the microbial community and the underlying control of the soil geochemistry. Of course, that all leads to microbial responses, um, which affects the ecosystem response, which might be altered by temperature, precipitation, and of course, changing CO2 might affect productivity in the vegetation, affecting the delivery of carbon to the soil. Here, we're really focused on the impact of temperature because uh, although there is variation in rainfall up and down the gradient, we didn't see much evidence of soil moisture constraint. In fact, there, there was no evidence in our data of soil moisture constraint. What do the first data look like? Uh, well, on the horizontal axis, we've got temperature. The vertical axis, we've got the emission of CO2 from soil. This is the net uh, efflux of CO2, commonly called soil respiration. Um, now, soil respiration, uh, the CO2 emerging from soil emerges predominantly from the breakdown of soil organic matter by microbes in the soil and of active roots in the soil. 
we got some rather classic temperature response data here. You see the, the responses here. There was a variation in the temperature response, i.e. The, um, the nature of this curve. Uh, we built some uh, fairly straightforward temperature and water models. Here's a picture of Adam making measurements with the uh, original automatic chamber. Uh, and on the right hand side towards the bottom is a graph of both temperature and volumetric water content controls on the vertical axis, which is uh, on, on the flux, which is in the vertical axis. Now, one thing to remember is this is net soil CO2 efflux. So the instrument has just put on a collar over the soil. Uh, this isn't a translocation experiment yet. And the Q10, the variation in temperature sensitivities, this, um, the angle of this uh, response curve uh, is really it's an apparent Q10, and I say apparent because there are multiple processes going on. If we go back to that blue box diagram I had at the start, we have the response, we have the temperature responses of fundamental reactions driven by, uh, well, there's some chemistry there, there's some enzymatic behavior, there's microbial growth. Um, so there are a whole number of processes there that deliver this apparent Q10 and um, understanding each of those processes would be the ideal way to try and understand overall temperature sensitivities. When we translocated soils and measured changes in the concentration of um, the soil organic carbon in the um, soil monoliths over time, we were able to track changes in Q10 over time. And here, this is a case, this is, these data are suggesting changes in soil are, well, derived from changes in soil carbon from heterotrophic respiration, so not the root respiration because of the, the nature of the soil monoliths, and they're comparing sites that were 10 degrees apart. The Q10s that they delivered didn't give exactly the same Q10s that we observed with native efflux values, but they were rather similar. And perhaps the most interesting thing to derive from this was the temperature sensitivities increased over time and that's because we saw ultimately we saw changes in the amount of labile carbon and um, recalcitrant carbon with more recalcitrant carbon, um, re well, recalcitrant carbon relatively increasing because labile carbon is used preferentially, leading to a carbon stock of overall more complex carbon compounds. And kinetic theory predicts a higher temperature sensitivity for these carbon compounds. So we've got results that were consistent with um, kinetic theory. But we're interested in what was explaining the differences in, in temperature sensitivity. And um, this turned out to be, to lead into um, much of the rest of the work. We weren't really able to track those differences clearly with the temperature or, or water models or with the carbon stocks or the thermal stability of the carbon, which haven't really shown, or with all that detail on the carbon composition. So the relative amounts of um, complex or simple compounds, which uh, was a little bit of a surprise. What the Q10 correlated most strongly with, with was how well protected the carbon was in terms of the physical protect, protection in the aggregates of the soil. Um, and of course that suggested that, well actually it was access to the carbon for the, for the um, bugs in the soil that was really determining this temperature sensitivity. And in the background of, of that, of course, we're also aware that there were different geochemical drivers going on. And as a very quick summary, on the top uh, line, we have a series of graphs representing the total elemental concentrations in the soil. Um, the horizontal is the elevation change and the vertical is the element um, concentration. And we saw all elements increasing over the elevation gradient, but critically, the availability of phosphate and nitrate varied, and this is consistent with classical theory about montane systems. At high elevation, we have less biological activity, less availability of nitrates because of that reduced biological activity, but um, much younger soils, uh, the role of erosive action becomes more important, and we expect to see higher phosphate availabilities, and this was consistent with theory. Um, and similarly, uh, the reduced nitrate availability at high elevation and increased nitrate availability at low elevation was similarly consistent with that theory. So we had some underpinning physical drivers. 
Okay, so we thought a little bit about some of the basic drivers of soil carbon dynamics, some of the soil geochemistry, um, and we've begun to think about the response of the microbial community. And just going back to this graph, this graph by Vidra et al. from 2013, makes some simple assumptions in some of the earlier models describing microbial ecology, and the differences in the assumptions that are made about the microbial response results in very large uncertainty in terms of global soil carbon stocks over this century. So I want to move towards those microbes in the soil and we realized we knew very little about them but it was an exciting opportunity to discover more about them. I spoke a little bit about carbon stocks, sensitivity to physical constraints and we've con thought about short term and long term they will return to long term right at the end and now on to turn to those natural gradients of diversity and function and perhaps their role in the temperature response. Um, and this was, for me, this was uh, really exciting. Uh, it felt like it was real discovery science. The grant I wrote to support this work um, had one line in it about the biogeography of microbes up and down these gradients because I didn't think NERC would um, support a whole proposal addressing this question. Um, and so I, I wrapped it up in the soil temperature response um, and translocation experiment work, but we were able to deliver this as well. And it was with a really exciting collaboration with Noah Fiera in Colorado, who at the time was, well, he still is, but at the time he had access, he had access to sequencing technology that really wasn't available in the UK. By the time we'd won the grant, NERC got back to me and said, oh, we've set up a, a center to do this. Uh, but it, at the time of writing it, we're right on the cusp of the availability of the technology there. Okay, uh, so I've talked about fancy technology, but I now want to go all the way back to von Humboldt. Of course, we know um, almost everybody involved in proving work will probably be a great fan of von Humboldt. Um, we're all familiar with the species diversity patterns that he first reported. Uh, well, his work was specifically in relation to elevation, but those patterns have been observed over um, latitude as well. Um, the picture on the left is a uh, from is part of a painting by Weich that's held in the National Gallery in Berlin, and the picture on the um, right-hand side is uh, his image, his sort of classic biogeographical image of Mount Chimpanzoro. Um, and changes in vegetation and soil and climate with elevation. And we've superimposed the, the Veitch paper on top of the Peruvian uh, transit here. I don't know whether that's awful or whether it's good, but it was fun to do at the time. Um, but of course, nobody had looked at microbes. And of course, they're this huge, huge component of our world, a third great biotic group. And we really only got to it 200 years later. Now we know Humboldt's work has influenced thinking on plant biogeography all the way from all the way through Holdridge um, to underpinning the presets of dynamic global vegetation models that uh, comprise major components of our current Earth system models. But that really uh, has driven plant biogeography and of course associated to animal biogeography as well. But what about soil micro uh, microbial biogeography? Well, the prevailing evidence suggested that there wasn't this kind of latitudinal uh, and elevation related change in microbial diversity. Uh, although the patterns appeared to be scale dependent and at small scale, we were able to see very large changes in diversity with soil properties, organic matter inputs, soil properties in particular pH. Uh, and at latitudinal scales, there was some evidence, but it was a little bit inconclusive that climate and um, soil abiotic factors, soil pH, affected um, microbial diversity. And this hugely cited paper by um, Fiera, I haven't written it down on the, uh, on the slide, um, showed how bacteria, bacterial diversity was really very strongly related to soil pH. So um, this might've been the reason why um, uh, the thought was that microbes were affected by local environmental selection factors. What were the first data from uh, 
Cosney Patter. Well, actually, they were consistent with this. This is a paper that uh, Noah and I put together, and Noah did actually led this work, sampling, uh, well, collecting bat and bird species and tree species diversity data across the elevation gradient, and then um, diversity in bacteria on leaves and in soil right across the elevation gradient. And his data suggested that there wasn't, although there were changes in the community composition, there wasn't a change in diversity. However, at about the same time, we'd been uh, looking at uh, microbial communities in a rather um, simpler way by identifying different groups, looking at their membrane lipid markers. Um, so we wanted to look at the same question because we were aware of the functional differences between fungal and bacteria, fungi and bacteria. And we have two graphs here showing the change in altitudinal, in altitude in what's called, uh, these are phospholipid fatty acids, but they're membrane lipids. The total PLFA gives us some estimate of the change in microbial biomass with elevation. And the different markers were able to tell us how, the, um, how those, that biomass was comprised how the composition changed, and we saw a very large increase in the fungal to bacterial ratio over elevation gradient. So the, the membrane lipid marker suggested that there was strong biological variation with elevation, and we suspected this was related to function. And when we tested that in the lab by getting bits of soil and feeding the soil with different types of carbon, we were able to show that the flux of CO2 from those different bits of soil um, responded to the relative complexity of the carbon compounds. Uh, and this was strongly related to the biological components in the soil. This particular result demonstrates the importance of total biomass and bacterial biomass, but either other types of carbon compounds that we were giving to the soil um, reflect their, their impact on the CO2 flux from the soil samples, where my mouse is, was also reflected in the fungal to bacterial ratio. So we had some evidence of changes in community composition uh, relating to functional differences. And we thought, well, this is a real opportunity to analyze this at a finer taxonomic resolution. But first, of course, we wanted to see how those species distributed with temperature and then to see whether there were functional differences. Uh, this is the uh, change in temperature with elevation that we see. So we, the advantages of this uh, sampling transits are a huge variation over a short distance in mean annual temperature from 25 down to, well, areas we didn't quite, um, well, the coolest areas going down to 5 or 10 degrees C. What was critical here was that we did much more sampling than NOAA had been able to in the first paper. Uh, and then fundamentally what we also saw was that there was a narrow difference in pH across the gradient and this substantially helped the study because of course the uh, if we remember the diagram here we were aware that uh, soil pH certainly affected bacterial uh, diversity very substantially at large um, regional scales. So we sampled um, plants and the soils for 14 uh, one hectare plots and Miles provided us with the, the plants data. We used rRNA to determine um, bacterial markers and fungal markers to uh, derive diversity based on uh, operational taxonomic units. And what were the results? Well, this graph here shows the classical uh, observation that von Humboldt made, elevation along the bottom, plant alpha diversity, um, and it declines very rapidly with elevation. What happened with the microbes? Uh, well, we saw an overall decline with microbes as well. Now we saw some variation and you can see those fits sh show some variation, but overall there's a very substantial um, decline in both fungi and microbes. Fungi are on the, uh, the brown in the middle, and microbes on the right. <clears throat> That the variation that we see we think is related to some other differences in the soils across the transect uh, that affect these microbes and that might be plant associations or nutrient associations but the fundamental finding there was that there seemed to be some generality between plants and microbes. 
in terms of their response to um, elevation. So it suggested uh, a really universal pattern between temperature and diversity, and perhaps most importantly, covariating effects of plants and microbes. And it's worth just stopping for a second to say, well, why hadn't this been observed before? And there are, there are various reasons. One is the technology to be able to get at microbial diversity. Microbes are diff difficult to culture. Um, of course, the lipid technology has been around for a while, but not that long. And the sequencing, the availability of sequencing uh, technology has, has really been very recent. But there were ecological considerations in the study as well. The range in temperature is very large and our sampling intensity was was much higher than before and I think critically the range in pH was very narrow so we avoided other confounding factors and these um, uh, studies here show similar attempts to look at microbial diversity over elevation changes and they were all influenced we um, estimate by different factors that we were able to remove in in our study. So we felt very lucky to be able to get a signal that appeared to be related to temperature. When we looked at uh, the community composition, uh, we were also able to show some differences. So when we compared samples across different elevation differences and compared them with the dissimilarity of those communities, we were able to show that um, plants, bacteria and fungi all differed over that, that uh, elevation range and there was a perhaps um, the largest changes were in bacteria and plants, but they were also visible in fungi. We made a very large number of measurements on these samples and uh, ended up, well, started with very large statistical models that were narrowed down to some uh, much more, much simpler ones retaining the significant factors, but mean annual temperature was by far the strongest driver of the relationship with both alpha and beta diversity patterns. Uh, we did see a secondary role for organic nutrients, which you can see in, in the table here. Uh, and we also think there's probably a role for soil plant interactions, especially perhaps at mid elevation sites. We also saw that there were changes in the different types of uh, microbes that were abundant at different elevations. So here we have elevation along the bottom and we have relative abundance of uh, different groups here. And we see that those with a faster metabolism were more abundant uh, at low elevation, copiotrophs, and those with a slower metabolism were more abundant at higher elevation which is of course consistent with what we might have expected but it was really exciting to see this and there are also some other discoveries that emerged from the work so this group um, Archae uh, rhizomycetes uh, had only recently been uh, identified um, in any location and uh, they'd been first identified I think in arctic uh, soils here they comprised a pretty substantial amount of the uh, microbial community. So this seemed uh, they were more um, abundant at higher elevation, um, probably in association with uh, nutrient acquisition, but their substantive uh, representation of the microbial community here uh, was just felt like a completely new world to be entering into and learning about. Okay, um, so we've identified some compositional differences up and down the uh, elevation range and diversity differences. What might be the impacts on uh, function? Well, here in this study, we were able to take some soil samples, uh, feed them uh, or measure the growth rates in bacteria and fungi by incorporation of different chemical, different um, uh, uh, substrates. And if you uh, do those measurements at multiple temperatures, you can back calculate the minimum temperature for growth. And we noticed that the minimum temperature for growth varied very substantially over this 
elevate over the elevation gradient represented here by mean annual temperature. So there were differences in growth adaptation that we were observing that were related to the different, the different microbial communities. We also showed that the enzyme activities varied with elevation. We, if you recall, we were we had previously identified more available phosphorus in the uplands and more available nitrogen in the lowlands. We have elevation along the horizontal axis here and hydrolytic enzyme activity along the vertical axis. And we see that phosphorus activity increases relatively more in the lowlands, where there is less phosphorus available, uh, and uh, less so in the uplands where there is more phosphorus available. So we saw differences in enzyme activities, so functional properties of the soils with elevation that were also um, associated with those compositional differences. And then when we looked at, uh, when we tried to connect the two, we compared bacterial operational taxonomic unit pairwise differences in our samples with enzyme enzymatic activity pairwise differences. And this is across seven different extracellular enzymes addressing carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus. And we saw, um, although there's a bit of noise in the relationship, there's a very significant relationship between the enzyme activity and the difference in bacterial um, species composition. So we were beginning to link those functional differences with the bacterial and soil communities. Okay, I see time's running out. Um, uh, I'm just coming towards uh, the end of the talk now. Um, we spoke about uh, large soil carbon stock, sensitivity to uh, physical resources. Um, we then went to natural gradients of diversity because we, at the start, we didn't really know what those natural gradients of diversity were and were they related to function. We've spoken about that and perhaps their role in the temperature response and say the T-min of growth provides us a direct relationship with that. But we also wanted to look at the longer term responses. And this, uh, this, um, the translocation experiment that we'd set up with Michael Zimmerman, Andy was able to go back to it and resample it. So uh, I'm now recycling my slides. Here's the same slide you saw before, uh, the same translocation experiment, the same uh, large change in um, temperature. What did we get over the longer term? Uh, now, I realize that five years is not very long in the time scale of an ecosystem, uh, but for us it's a pretty long time and we hope to be able to go back for uh, longer term samples again, uh, but this provided us with the longest term incubations we could look at. Uh, we have sampled the soils for this T-min growth rate, and this is the graph you saw before on the observational gradient, the natural gradient to change it, a difference in T-min. What we found was that when we took those translocated microbial communities and recalculated T-min, we found that they, they flipped pretty quickly. So if you move a soil from this cool location to this warm location, we see that the T-min converts to the warm location T-min um, within a, well, we had have, we have two um, age classes of two and 11 years. These samples were part of the longer term sampling. Um, and we were able to show that they completely, or more or less completely flipped in terms of their um, T-min capability uh, over that time period. So we saw a change in the functional properties and we saw that there was a significant change in the relative abundance of taxa that we know are associated with either warm um, conditions or cool conditions. And this graph represents some of those warm adapted and cold, adapt cold adapted species that we saw changing. Not all of them changed, but the ones that we saw were highly consistent with a global study of temperature responses and microbial taxa. So we saw changes in those taxa and changes in their functional properties in the translocation. And what was the overall effect on soil carbon? So uh, here we have uh, we make use of the whole range and the change in temperature that's possible from that whole range. So we can have an elevation shift of going down as well as going up, if you like. Um, and here on the vertical axis, we have the percentage carbon in the destination over the percentage carbon of origin, which allows us to estimate the loss of carbon over time. And we saw a very large loss of carbon over that five year time period. 
uh, a 4% proportional decrease per one degree increase. If you took these numbers and extrapolated them to the global tropics, it'd be equivalent of about an 80 petagram carbon loss by 2100 for a um, four degree C warming, which is a large proportion of the atmospheric um, carbon concentration. Um, more importantly, that number is much larger than was previously estimated by um, uh, studies that have made some assumptions about tropical soils uh, for which we haven't had much empirical data until now. That empirical data is beginning to emerge. Uh, so on the top half of this slide is the graph and data I just showed you, but are there any other results that are consistent with this? Well, um, early on in the study, we were able to contribute our soils to a global lab study um, that was aimed at trying to understand whether soils, how soils responded to warming, in this case over a 90 day lab experiment, did they uh, acclimate to that warming or cooling? It was actually a cooling experiment, but there's some details there that I won't go into. And the data from that experiment suggested that on average, globally, soils did, the, the temperature response in soil respiration did not acclimate to the change in temperature. And that was particularly true for high carbon to nitrogen soils. Um, much more recently, Andy, who did all this work along the transect and hopes to do some more along the transect and along additional transects in South America, that's part of the work he's just had funded, um, has also led the development of the experiment that I didn't dare do because I'd just kept the rain off the, off the forest. Um, and he has implemented a re really challenging full profile soil warming experiment uh, that uh, is called Swelter. Um, the results have just come out. Uh, they show a very large increase in the short term respiratory carbon loss. Of course, we don't know what will happen over the long term and that might uh, decline substantially. But the key finding there is that the response to temperature is larger than was expected for tropical soils, which is consistent with our soil translocation study. Um, when you extrapolate those findings to the global tropics, although the numbers are different, this is 65 petagrams versus the 80 petagrams from the translocation study, they're in the same ballpark and they're both substantially larger than existing estimates for uh, the tropics. Okay, I think that's why I bring it to an end. Just to summarize, uh, we were lucky enough to uh, be able to test microbial species biogeography in a way that hasn't been possible before partly because of the intensity of sampling, but I think especially because of the narrow pH range that we were able to uh, sample over. And we showed that there was some uniformity in terms of plant species distribution and microbial species distribution with elevation and therefore temperature. And this seems like a really fundamental pattern that has been difficult to show before. Of course, they interact. And then focusing on the carbon dynamics question, and of course, the two link with each other, we've uh, been able to explore the relationships between um, the temperature response in soil carbon dynamics, their, their relationship with microbial composition and enzyme activities, the effects of species, microbial species composition on function, and of course, the overall result on the response to warming. Now, of course, these questions, uh, we're interested in the long-term response uh, to warming, and one area that is particularly fertile and really hasn't been explored very much yet is, is the interaction between plant and soil on soil carbon dynamics. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to have a picture of Adin again on this last slide. Adin's fundamentally underpinned our ability to do this work uh, and it's been great working with him with all the, over all these years. Um, uh, thanks also to a huge cast of people who were all named on that first slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks Patrick, that's great. Okay, uh, over to questions now. Any, any questions? Do you want to perhaps stop sharing for now Patrick and we can see everyone? Yep. Uh, and I encourage everyone to switch on their cameras if they're happy with that, because it's nice to see faces. Where am I sharing? 
That's the one I want. Just ask the question, I'll sort this out as we go along. Is it my answer, Anthony? Yeah, Patrick, when you, uh, when you went and revisited them after a long period of time and you showed that their, their carbon responses were going in the, in the directions you predicted, did, did you look at community composition again? And what I'm wondering is how much of the change was due to changes in community composition in the bacteria and how much of it was due to in situ evolution or cassette swapping or selective sweeps? Uh, sorry, the, the line cut a bit there. Can you say it again? Yeah. So you went back and you revisited, revisited your samples and you saw the overall ecosystem response in, in the way that you predicted. How much of that was due to changes in the composition of the microbial community versus in situ evolution or kind of horizontal cassette swapping of things that could, could do those functions? Uh, so I, I don't think we have an answer to that question about the relative contribution. We think that most of the change that we observe is not due to uh, dispersal affecting the composition. We think it's change in those um, uh, in the monoliths rather than dispersal. There seems to be good evidence for that, but we don't. We we weren't able to quantitatively separate out the two. Okay, Josh, I might have missed this, but. Um... When you went back and resampled, did you look at the character of the carbon? Did you do NMR, for example, uh, and see if you could see the evolution since the start of the experiment? And I guess related to that, I'm wondering if those projections you have for like centennial timescale response might be modulated by the fact that your more labile carbon gets consumed early. And so then you're left with stuff that's more recalcitrant and you're going to respire more slowly. Yes, yeah, no, it's, um, uh, so that, that graph, that centennial graph is sort of jaw dropping, which I suppose is why we use it because it, it shows the level of uncertainty. Um, it does reflect a, a parameter in the models that is, um, it's, it's an emergent parameter that's dependent on a number of processes, one of which you've, you've identified. And it's very poorly constrained, that parameter, which is why I didn't go into it in detail. Um, but it does reflect the level of uncertainty in those models. In answer to your question, yes, we did do the NMR. Um, and uh, there just wasn't space to include it. In fact, it was a bit of a challenge to compress the story that I did into the time available. I hope I did it intelligibly. Um, uh, we did see a change. So we saw a... Um, relative increase in the recalcitrant carbon over time and that was consistent with at least over the short term a change in the q10s which would be consistent with kinetic theory um, and andy can correct me here but i think we've also got it over the longer term and we see more of the same we see a, a change in um, a relative increase in the availability of the recalcitrant carbon but the q10 story or the temperature response story is very interesting and it seems to be consistent with the in situ warming experiment that Andy's delivered since. Um, and it suggests that uh, the expectations from kinetic theory under predict the response to temperature. Andy's going to say something. Sorry, I was muted. So I had, uh, just adding to that. Uh, so we we, we, this, the data Patrick showed for the, the shift in NMR was following two years of after Michael sampled after two years. And then we found the, sh the same shift in alkyl O alkyl ratios after five years, consistent with what you'd expect as we're losing the labile carbon. And we just sampled us all again just last December, which is actually 11 years after Michael first moved those cores up and down the mountainside. And um, so that soil is waiting to be analyzed. We haven't done anything with that soil yet. So I'm hoping to get some money <laughs> to, to analyze it. But it'll be really interesting to see whether we're seeing these consistent changes in soil carbon composition and in content over time. And um, I should also add that we had, we, we were, there were two translocation experiments we, that we ran. There was another short-term one where we dug up another set of soil samples and translocated them just for a two-year period. <laughs> 
which is um yeah there's hardly any soil left up there it's like what well, my translocation wasn't enough <laughs> 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 Okay. I had a question about the, uh, the community turnover. Uh, if I, I think there was a dissimilarity graph that showed, perhaps with the fungi, that most of, most of the turnover seemed to occur in the submontane region. And once you got into the cloud forest zone, there didn't seem to be much dissimilarity by, by the change. Uh, uh, and whereas the bacterial one perhaps did show a more continuous change over the entire transit. So I'm thinking about it, how much being in the cloud forest affects the, the soil community, this, this humid oh. cloud inundated in space. It seemed like the fungal system just kicked in around 1,500 metres all the way up to 3,000. Yeah, and, and interestingly, though I didn't show the data, the termites fall out at about that, um, mm -hmm. that elevation as well. There are clearly um, big changes going on there. And on one of the graphs, I think it'll probably take too long to go back to it, but on the, um, the Humboldt graph, if you like, uh, we saw that fungi varied. So there was a general reduction in diversity as you go up the mountain in both fungi and microbes. However, in the organic layer, so the surface layer of the soil, the fungal uh, pattern was rather different and there seemed to be a mid-elevation uh, decline in diversity, even though in the mineral soil, um, the fungal diversity was more linear, and more consistent with the plant pattern. And um, we think that may be associated with uh, the change in chemistry in the soils and um, the, the, the presence of the cloud forest there, um, and also the turnover of plant species and the association of uh, perhaps particular fungal groups with um, different um, plant groups. So yes we think there's something interesting going on there that isn't fully explained um, and the lack of change in dissimilarity with the fungal um, groups that you you asked about is likely to be associated with that and it may just be dominant for example dominant plant species associated with particular fungal groups i think it might be something to do with a shift in mycorrhizal dominance possibly from am to em associated mycorrhizal communities so we're seeing a yeah, just and that transition in, in the, those mid elevation sites, we're seeing a possibly a complete, especially in those organic soils, a transition in the, in the entire fungal mycorrhizal community. So it's something we're interested in following up on. Well, where, do, where do the ectomycorrhizal tend, tend to dominate? Uh, are they, are the cloud forest species more, more or less? Higher active? elevation. Yeah, well, yeah. Yep. Yes, the prevailing paradigm is the montane. In, in the in this analogous to a latitudinal gradient, you see more a EM ectomycorrhizal dominated communities in high montane forests under um, low nitrogen availability. But um, there's very few data out there. And the, there have been a few studies come out of the Ecuador sites uh, involved with uh, Mateus Rillig, and they show that there's actually quite a lot of AM fungi in those high montane sites. So. Yeah, but the paradigm is a shift from EM to AM associated communities. Do you think there's any anything in a really long term view about those distributions? You know, the ecotone of the uh, the Puna pushing down slope um, during the ice ages, and so you know elevations down to maybe two thousand meters would have been Puna, and you know the, so that would constrain the upper limit of where these these mycorrhizae that live in forest would have been at that time. That's very interesting, I suppose. Sorry. I was just going to say, is it just too long a time period to think about a legacy effect from that kind of activity? Yeah, I was just about to use the word legacy. Um, that's a really interesting thought. Um, if there is a legacy in the um, plant species presence absence, then that might be reflected in what we see in the microbial um, uh, composition of the soils, because we think that the, the, although, you know, the microbial composition will be affected by a number of factors, but one of them is plant species presence absence. But the translocation experiment suggests that these communities um, switch relatively rapidly. We had a 100% switch in that team in for growth, for example, over the 11 year period. Uh, that was really interesting. <laughs>
Patrick, I had a quick question following up on Ed Bender's uh, question. Um, so I'm curious to know something about uh, the rate of turnover in microbial taxa compared with uh, the plant taxa. We've done some past work where we looked across latitude and a few other elevational gradients. And, and those analyses seem to indicate that the microbial taxa were turning over at a much slower rate than, um, than, than other kind of macrobiota, right? So if you look at, um, for example, like the latitudinal diversity gradient in, in mammals or birds or, or even in plants, you get these really steep latitudinal diversity you know, gradients. Whereas if you look, it, it, it at least looks as if within microbes, it's pretty shallow. Sure, there's a peak kind of in the tropics, but it, it's this kind of really gradual kind of dropping off. And I'm curious to know if, if, if you see something similar to that along the Peruvian gradient. Do you, do you see more homogenization than of taxa across the gradient? Um, I don't know, I'm just curious to know your thoughts on that. So the, that, um, yeah, go, going back to that, um, Humboldt slide, if you like, the mm -hmm. st what you describe is correct for our data from this valley as well. The steepness of the change in plant species diversity is, well, it, it, there's less um, variance in it and it's steeper than for fungi and bacteria. Um, the diversity, the, the absolute diversity numbers are higher, but the the, the gradient of the change is lower in fungi and bacteria. What seems to be the case is that fungi are slightly more decoupled from the plant, the change in plant um, diversity than the bacteria are. So that there, there are differences there. Um, so I suppose numerically the turnover might be higher, but relatively speaking, it's, it's not. Um, now the reasons for that I think are I don't think I have an answer for, but I think it's probably related to the um, flexibility in microbial metabolism within particular uh, clades and also our ability to distinguish those clades using the kind of uh, methods that we, we do. I don't know if you have additional thoughts on that, Andy. Um, so if it, were you sort of comparing the sort of latitudinal gradients and diversity with what we're seeing in and Cosnipata. So I think um, overall you don't see these large temperature driven changes in uh, bacterial and fungal diversity because oftentimes you see soil pH is a dominant driver in bacterial diversity gradients across when you look at broad scales. And I think in terms of the, these sites along the Cosnipata Valley we're just extremely fortunate that soil pH is fairly consistent. It sort of hovers around three and a half to four so and I think it's just because of that fluke that we're suddenly seeing this sort of temperature driven changes in uh, microbial diversity. And um, in terms of community composition, there's a big shift in bacterial community composition across the gradient, whereas the fungi seem to uh, follow more closely plant communities. Could it be that the microbial taxa have just wider dispersal kernels that they're, they are actually dispersing quite, quite a long ways and because of which kind of mellows out the gradient a little bit more. Yes, it may well be that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, rather than just metabolic flexibility or our ability mm -hmm. to distinguish um, clades. Mm -hmm. Though of course fungi are, are, yeah. fungi are highly mobile as well. Um, so it may be that there are differences in their patterns. So I suppose there's that to consider as well but um, they're both, the, the response to elevation for both of them uh, is less steep than it is for plants. I have, I have doubts whether dispersal is a, such a major factor in terms of bacterial, soil bacterial composition and diversity changes because you see such um, small scale changes within the soil, is micro scale changes the communities with, with rhizosphere communities and bulk soil. And I don't think I think that's that's clear. and between the organic horizon and the, the mineral horizon, which have very distinct bacterial communities, I think that's strong evidence that it's 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 in the environment that's shaping them rather than dispersal, or the environment is a barrier to the dispersal. Thank you.
Okay, any more questions? That's great. I think uh, a few people are allowing to leave now, so I think uh, if there's no more, I think uh, it's time to draw to a close. Uh, congratulations, Andy, on your new position. Is that, that's, uh, that's fantastic. It's great, great to hear. Great to have you around in the, Luke, in the UK as well for the near future. Uh, okay, and so at the moment, uh, Josh uh, did message me in saying that he can't do two weeks' time as he, uh, as he had planned. He can do for a month's time. So I don't know if anybody wants to volunteer for two weeks' time or a week or two's time. Uh, or if not, I'll send an email around and see whether we can persuade anyone to give a, give a talk. That, there's a doggy putting his hand up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Mark your dog's going to take it. Okay, it does everything. Uh, I guess people are a little busy with term time and things, but we'll try and have uh, something in a couple of weeks' time if somebody, if somebody feel, thinks about it and feels that they can produce something together. It's kind of useful just to, you know, it's not thoroughly thought through. It's kind of nice to just, uh, just get an overview. I think Patrick was pulling this together yesterday for what I gathered. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, I seem to remember you you, Claire, you were just finishing yours when you gave your talk. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the talk is, is, is a good incentive to actually pull together the slides and the ideas. It yeah. is, yeah. And, and what's, what's nice about it is that this, this group is, um, has such a fundamental interest in the, in, in the location as well as the general questions. And I, I think that makes it, an, um, it means you can... Uh, Perhaps there's a, a little bit of latitude there in the preparation time, if that right. is an encouragement. Mm -hmm. So Patrick and Andy, do you have time for one one other like question? Or do you guys got to go? I didn't want to bother everybody else with it. Oh, but God. Actually, actually I, I have just seen the time. Um, I've got to get kids to school. Okay, um, I'll ask uh, Andy. Are, are you sure? I'm sure Andy can handle it. He'll probably handle it better than me. <laughs> I'll listen to the question, then I'll head. Okay, so uh, one of the so Mark brought up the long term with the the Pleistocene, but the other thing that we see in the transect is that about that elevation, the Andes were low for long periods of time, and then kind of, you know ten to fifteen millions of years ago, you got a larger uplift, and then the species that came in from there were not species from the lowlands that then evolved up with the mountains. They were actually colonized from outside of South America or from the temperate zones of South America. So can that lead to the correspondence between the microbial community and the plant community that you see? Like those plants came in with, with EM instead of AM and that's just why you got it. Um, is that Patrick talking? No, Patrick's off. Um, yeah, I'm sure that is the case in terms of, um, I think that might be the case in terms of, certainly in terms of these plant associated microorganisms Mycorrhizal yeah. fungi for sure. I mean, plants don't go where mycorrhizal fungi aren't present. So I'm yeah. sure that's a legacy effect. I mean, you can see in terms of, so I was measuring this paradigm of EM fungal dominated uh, communities at higher elevations. And that's often because of a uh, more oak species, more quercus at higher elevation. And so it might well, we have none of those. Yeah, exactly. So that might be a reason why <laughs> in, in this part of the Andes, we don't see those EM yeah. dominated communities or not. So, um, so that, yeah, that, and that could be entirely due to just the, the, the trees that have, that have colonized that, that area. And of course, we talk about these switches as if they're absolute, but they're just quantitative, right? I mean, there's still plenty of lowland you yeah. Know, yeah. plays that are moving up high and would keep things all mixed. And there's some really interesting questions in terms of that and the, uh, the Puna grassland. If you do get that kind of EM to AM fungal shift yeah. across that, uh, whether these interactions are really important in the stability of that tree line as well, mm -hmm. whether the kind of the presence of the mycorrhizal associations might uh, constrain uh, movement of trees across the tree line. Very cool. Do you ever get shifts? Um, so if you do have taxa, like something like Prunus that's distributed from lowlands to tree line, do they shift, you know, the, even, you know, mycorrhizal strategy as they go along? So I like, didn't catch. Sorry. So if you have a, a taxon like Prunus that goes all the way from tree line down to the Amazon basin, do they shift in the type of mycorrhizae that they have? Or do they always do the same thing no matter what climate they're growing in? 
I don't know, but it would be really cool to find out. These are, these are the kind of questions that are just laying there open. And I think it'd be great to go and do some more detailed work on mycorrhizal associations. That's so cool. It's a gradient. Yeah, congratulations on the job and all your papers. Hey, right, thanks a lot. Okay, great to see everyone. So see you either in two or four weeks time, depending on what we plan. But uh, take care everyone. Have a fantastic. Great. Have a great. Thanks a lot.